Ruth Lenshinska, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and I've been a fan of the five legendary pianists who you were fortunate enough to have lessons with. And you're probably the only person who coached with all five of these phenomenal musicians. So there's Rachmaninoff, Hoffman, Petri, Corto, and Schnabel. All of whom were such different personalities and musicians in different styles. Who's the first of these five who you met? Hoffman. Okay. I met him when I was a tiny girl of five. Mm. And uh, he came to where we live in California and performed a concert in San Francisco. And my teacher was very interested in getting me to play for him. She tried to get me to play for every celebrity he came to town in order to get advice on how to handle me. Mm -hmm. And uh, she did this with Mr. Hoffman and we visited him in his hotel room okay. and played for him there as a very small girl. And he said that I should have the very best lessons possible and that I should go to Curtis Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would make it possible for me to go to Curtis Institute. And then we went to hear him play and it was a memorable concert. Mm -hmm. The uh, program piece that I remember most clearly was the funeral march from the B flat minor Chopin Sonata. It just, well, it was a first experience for me, and it was uh, a memorable one. Wow. And so then you, was he your primary teacher when you were at Curtis, or did you have lessons with him? I know he had a range of teachers who were... Yeah, he had a, a, an assistant whose name was uh, Madame Bengerova. Yes. And yeah. she was famous as a teacher. Oh, yeah. And uh, she drilled her students in all the scales, mm -hmm. in different positions. You had not only to play the scales up and down, each hand alone, both hands together, but in thirds and in sixths. Mm. So, and she really got after you to... That was the old Russian method of teaching. Yeah. And the only place in America that taught the scales in that way. Uh -huh. and, uh, we took great pride in pleasing Madame Vingarova. Mm -hmm. Wow, amazing. Um, and did you have any other lessons with Hoffman directly, or you just got to hear him play or meet him at other times? Well, he, when he was in town, he invited me to his home for lessons. And I didn't realize that the lessons were the thing I was going for. I thought I was invited to play with his little boy, Anton. Right. And I went forward to those as, you know, play sessions. I was only five years old. Right. And Anton was about six. And he always had a pair of jacks in his pocket. And we'd get on the floor. You take out these jacks and throw them, and we count them and throw them. <laughs> you know how kids play together, and that's mm -hmm. what I was looking forward to. Right. But incidentally, I played the piano for Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. What kind of, um, are there any specific learnings from Hoffman directly that you recall, like things that he focused on in your playing? Well, he couldn't very well. You see, he was a concertizing artist. Yeah. He played little baby pieces, mm -hmm. uh, little pieces by Grieg, little pieces by Bach, little pieces by Beethoven, little baby pieces. Mm -hmm. And this, he encouraged me. That's about all I can say. So right. 
and he very kind and very gentle, which was a great contrast to the way my father taught, which was anything but kind and gentle. Right. So, and especially having that kind of positive support from somebody who was so famous and whose playing you admired as well, that must have gone a long way for you. Well, it was a great experience. Wonderful. My first great experience with a really great artist that I didn't appreciate at the time. <laughs> Well, I mean, like you said, at the age of five, how can you actually, you know, and you were enjoying, you know, going to play with the sun, how could you understand? I mean, you know, nowadays you hear the name Hoffman and it's, you know, it's this, this, you know, sort of at the top of the pantheon of legendary pianists. Well, there's more to it than that. Years later, when I mentioned Joseph Hoffman, I found a diplomat in the American service who was a roommate of his in college. And Hoffman was not a music major. He was uh, an engineer. Mm -hmm. and in fact, the Steinway pianos that he played showed a couple of improvements that he convinced the Steinway people they had to do to make it a better, more useful instrument. Yeah, no, he was an incredible inventor. I mean, he was a brilliant mind. Yes. So, oh, that's amazing. Something that was not musical. Yeah. What was his major in college, not music. Wow. So, so then Hoffman was the first. And was Rachmaninoff the next one who you met? Or was it oh, one no, of the others? was the last. Okay. Uh, after that, I, I met Egon Petri. Okay. So he's another, I mean, phenomenal musician who yeah. trained with Busoni. How how did you come to meet Petri? Where was this? Well, this was in Berlin. Okay. Father decided very early that uh, I would get better training in Europe because mm -hmm. there were more people who were training in that particular way than in America. In right. America, music was a very new art and most people did not train in the same way as meticulously mm -hmm. as they did in Europe where it was an old established art. Now, Egon Petri was the son of Henry Petri and Henry Petri was a great violin teacher and my father aspired to study with him. And he produced his son, Egon, and so my father decided, well, Henry Petrie's son should be a, a good teacher for me. Okay. And also, we had met someone in uh, California named Gunnar Johansson, mm -hmm. who had excellent reputation yeah. as a performing pianist and teacher. And he had studied under Egon Petrie. Right. And so... Uh, we went to see Mr. Petri, and Petri taught in the studio of Ferruccio Busoni. And Madame Busoni, the widow, would come in where all the students were waiting early in the morning, like nine o'clock, and she'd bring a box of chocolates, and she'd say, would you like a chocolate? No, no. Would you like a chocolate? No. And because she said no, nobody dared to take the, ch the chocolate. <laughs> nine o'clock is a bit early in the morning for a chocolate, anyway. <laughs> yeah. But she she offered them in any case, let it not be said, she was not a good hostess. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so then so you were were you still five at this time or a little bit older? Six. Six. Okay. And, and what Time I came for my lesson that time, and I heard some phenomenal playing in the next room. I couldn't get it. it wasn't Mr. Petrie. This was much more forceful than Mr. Petrie played, and mm -hmm. also it was quicker, and it didn't sound like Mr. Petrie. And and out of the studio, 
eventually Mr. Bakery came out and there was this handsome young man. He says, this is whom you have been hearing. He says, his name is Vladimir Horowitz. And he just broke up with his trio. He wants to make a living as a pianist. And he is playing for all the teachers in Berlin and asking them to please bring their students to hear him play because he wants to start uh, making a living as a pianist. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, Petri was also, I mean, he was a phenomenal pianist. He was. And uh, not always at ease in the studio but in person he appears to have really been able to i mean he played with incredible power and warmth and strength and how, how what what do you feel that you learned from him particularly how to practice hmm. i have the patience to do uh he was uh well he liked to work with accents Hmm. And he would do loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, then soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, and then soft, soft, loud, soft, 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 loud, soft, 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 loud, soft, 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 loud, soft, 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 loud, in order to give emphasis on different notes until every note was given its full due. And as a result, you listen for every note. Hmm. Well, it worked. It doesn't sound like a likely method, but it does work. Hmm. It's a method that I still use at times, okay. and I have found that students who use that method does work. It does work. Wow. It's very good. It's useful. Did you hear him play much in concert while you were there? Yes, I went to every concert that he played. And he was a marvelous pianist, mm -hmm. a marvelous pianist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he took his playing for granted. Of course, he's a marvelous pianist. He had good training. He practices. Why shouldn't he be a marvelous pianist? He had students who were marvelous pianists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, in his studio, he welcomed other musicians who came to Berlin. And among them was an old gentleman. His name was Alexander Glazunov. Wow. He came from Russia at the time. And I remember he's bearded. And he spoke Russian to Mr. Petri. Mr. Petri was able to answer him. See, Mr. Petri was born in Poland. Mm. And I was Polish background. So, of course, I felt a certain... Mm, affinity or connection yes. yeah yes. wow so how how long did you take lessons with mr petri then as long as i was in berlin mm -hmm. i went to see mr petri mm -hmm. often as i could as i learned a new piece mm -hmm. to his studio he'd see me there well what i've been working on and i would play it for him and he would make certain little corrections i think most important thing I learned with him was uh, the Haydn variations in F minor. Mm -hmm. Also, I learned uh, Italian concerto of Bach that year. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, when Mr. Horowitz told me that he was going to play this concert, I said, well, I'm going to play a concert too. And we talked as if we were colleagues, even though I didn't realize I was five years old, right. six years old. And he told me what he was going to play, which of course meant nothing to me. But uh, I remember going to the concert. The, it's in uh, the Zoni Saal and uh, Beethoven Saal, where everyone played in. Berlin and walked on stage by walking upstairs about six steps and then you made a turn and then you were on stage. 
and he came up and after the concert and was wiping his forehead and he saw me sitting on the top step and he wiped my forehead too. He remembered me. How charming. Yeah. Wonderful. Wow, what a rich experience. I mean, Berlin at that time, I mean, that was uh, an incredible musical mecca. Yes, 31. Wow, wow. And so then who was, was that, now Schnabel was in Berlin for a period, so was that where you met him? Oh, I met Mr. Schnabel in the Bigstein uh, piano house. Okay. He liked to go there to try the various pianos, the new pianos as they came out. And uh, I like to go there because one of the things that a pianist goes through is nervousness mm -hmm. about playing new pieces mm -hmm. on different pianos. Mm -hmm. You can play it fine on your piano at home, mm -hmm. but you go to another piano and suddenly you can't play it. <laughs> yeah, it right. doesn't work. Yeah. And you have to get used to playing the new piece on different pianos. Mm -hmm. And the only way I could do that is to go to a piano store, play it on this piano, and then on this piano. This. By right. the time I got through playing it on 15 or 20 different instruments of various quality and various response, I knew the piece. Yeah, indeed. I wasn't afraid of it anymore. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So then, so then I, you you met Schnabel at Bechstein. I went to the Bechstein house, and I was trying out some kind of a new piece, probably one of the two little uh, Beethoven sonatas, Opus Fifty Four. I don't know. No. Da -dee -da 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 -dee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know the one. And I forget the number too, but I know the one. Those uh, sonatas. I was trying those out on the various pianos, and Mr. Schnabel asked somebody, Who is that playing? And that somebody directed him to me, he said, It's a little six year old girl. And Schnabel wanted to have a look. And my father didn't need a second invitation. <laughs> Pushed me forward and had to play for him. And Mr. Schnabel invited me to come and listen to his students play. And then he invited me to play. And of course, after hearing his wonderful students, I tried to play somewhat like them. And they all applauded me. And I started learning, and Mr. Schnabel started showing me little things mm. that I need to make my sonata sound better. And that's how I learned. Wow. What do you remember? Anything specific from of what he was showing you? Or well, yes. I played at that time a Mozart sonata in F major. Dee, da, dee. Da, da, dee, da, da, da. When I came to uh, the second theme is dee, da, da, bum, ah, da, da, bum. well, he said I, I played it too stiffly and that I should try to play it more as if I were speaking. And he said some words. He said, Ina bloom, Ina bloom, a mm -hmm. flower. And right. I should make it sound like a flower, the delicacy of a flower. And that was his way of making music. And I thought, why, that's charming. That's sort of mm. like making a picture come to life. Indeed. And, I love and it's that. literal phrasing. I mean, it's like using it with the language and the way, you know, our, our voices will go up and down in a sentence and to have a musical phrase in the same way. It, it, it kind of demystifies it, doesn't it? Well, it puts it in a new light. That's it. I wasn't playing C, B flat, A or what yes. have you. Yeah. I wasn't counting three and one, two, three. I was 
the flower. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. So how how often did you play for him? And I don't even know how long you stayed in Berlin for that whole for that period. I wasn't in Berlin for a full year okay. because my father was afraid that Hitler might come into power. Right. Right. He had seen something that bothered him. Mm -hmm. and he did not want to stay in Berlin. And he decided that we're right. not too far from Paris. Yeah. Maybe we should try going to Paris, France. Okay. Left Berlin and went to France after that. And so I'm assuming that would be where you met Courteau. Well, I had met Courteau in California. You see, he was among those celebrities that my teacher wanted me to play for. Mm -hmm. and, and I had played for Mr. Courteau in uh, California. And he said that if I ever came to Paris, he would teach me. Now, my father took this literally. Mm -hmm. But actually, these people, they didn't mean it that way. Right. No, oh, you go to the school. I'll be glad you can call me up once in 10 years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so then from Berlin, you went to Paris and you called up Mr. Courteau. <laughs> and Mr. Courteau had a whole school. Yeah. It was the Ecole Normale. Yes. And it was the place where uh, young musical kids could go and learn how to be professional musicians. Mm -hmm. And it was run by a friend of Mr. Courtois named Mr. Mongeau. Mr. Mongeau, very proud of the way he ran that place. And I wasn't the only prodigy that uh, attended there. At the time that I was there, Mr. Mongeau was very proud of a uh, Spanish boy. And every time I was there, Mr. Mongeau would say, his Mozart is so great, it's so delicate, it's so fine. And my father was furious <laughs> having to listen to this <laughs> Oh my goodness! Do you remember the name of this fellow, this pianist? No. I'll 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 do a little digging. I'll see a friend of mine is an expert on the fr people who trained in France, and I'll see if I can track down <laughs> who this fellow with the fine Mozart was. Now, so you had lessons directly with Mr. Corto, though, at the Ecole Normale. Yes, but I had more lessons from listening to the classes. Mm -hmm. that his assistants taught. Right. And main, his main assistant at that time was a lady, uh, Madame Giro Latars. Yeah. Yeah. Madame Giro taught whole classes of students a single major work. Like you would be in a class where there were eight pianists who played one after another the chromatic fantasy in Fugue of Bach. Well, that's no small piece. Oh. I was six years old. And my father and I listened to every one of these people play the chromatic fantasy in Fugue. Hmm. Well, nothing would do, but I had to play at least a prelude in Fugue. Until then, I had only played inventions, right. little small pieces. But my father didn't give any thought to that. My daughter Ruth can do anything, he thought. And mm -hmm. together with his magic stick, mm -hmm. he got to feeling that this was true. And of course, nobody knew it, but I practiced eight, nine hours every day just in order to do things that were unbelievable. Yeah. And I think any idiot can be driven to do anything. Yeah. yeah. And I was driven, literally driven to do all those things. Yeah. I was 
I learned preludes and fugues so far, and eventually I knew already the Italian concerto, which I had learned in Germany. Right. And uh, eventually I learned the chromatic fantasy and fugue by the time I was eight. Now, you weren't still in Paris, so you didn't get to play it for her, did you? <laughs> at uh, the Ecole Normale. Well, I stayed in Paris. Did you? Okay. Stayed in Paris until I was 14. But of course, between times, mm. I would go to America for three months and play a lot of concerts. Somebody had to finance all this. Mm -hmm. The concerts right. finance right. are living in Paris. And so did you stay... So for all that time in Paris, were you at the Ecole Normale then or working with other teachers? I was working with other teachers as well. I worked, Mr. Corteau was dissatisfied with the way I sight read. Okay. And he recommended that I go to the uh, Conservatoire. And so I went to the Conservatoire and uh, they immediately put me in a sight reading class, okay. which meant that I showed up at nine in the morning and I was given a bunch of cards. From nine to 10, I had to show up in this trombone class and play the piano. Wow. It was a, a trombone class for beginners. So if I played a few well notes, it didn't matter. But right. I had to read, read, read. At 10 o'clock, I had to show up in this voice class, Sopranos. So I showed up there, and the voice was not uh, opera star, but some young kid learning, and I had to play the accompaniment. Well, it didn't take long for me to learn how to sight read. Right. And play, because for eight hours, yeah. I just played every hour on the hour, play a different kind of accompaniment. Wow. And I learned. I was a good sight reader at the end of the time. <laughs> and I also made friends. I made friends with other people. And I learned from a lady named Madame Marguerite Long, who was a very oh. highly respected French uh, piano oh, yeah. teacher. <laughs> she was a special friend gentleman named Maurice Ravel. Mm -hmm. And Maurice Ravel had written a piece that nobody could play. Nobody. They took one look at it and about fainted. <laughs> it was called Jurdo. Mm -hmm. And she showed this to me. I was 11 years old at the time. And a pretty good sight reader, I might add. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I looked at that and just, no, don't make me learn that. But she said, if you learn that, I'll introduce you to Maurice Ravel. <laughs> I wanted to meet Maurice Ravel, but I didn't want to. I, I couldn't at that time. Really? But you did? Uh, I did meet Maurice Ravel mm -hmm. because all the kids knew him. He conducted... A class in composition, and he was a fabulous teacher. I met the kids, the American kids in his class, among whom was a boy named Jean Philippe, an American kid, John Philip. Mm -hmm. Well, Philip was the name that his parents chose because he was the king of Portugal, and the boy was born on his birthday. <laughs> so he was John Philip. His last name was Sousa. And this kid was something of a genius. Hmm. He could make anything sound like the most wonderful <laughs> march in the world. Wow. I mean, Mr. Ravel, whenever he needed a march, Jean-Pierre, he always called him Jean-Pierre, Mm. see what you can do with this melody <laughs> maybe two hours later Jean-Pierre was there 
and on the piano he bang it out da 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 bum 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 but bum 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 <laughs> everything turned into a march wow fascinating <laughs> I mean, I, I'm guessing, I mean, around that time, that would have been when Ravel wrote his piano concerto for it, which was dedicated to Marguerite Long, mm -hmm. right? That was around 1932 or so. <laughs> wow. what, a what a time to be around these incredible musicians. Well, you couldn't help but be a musician if you were with them all the time and you heard them and you heard the same thing over and over and over, not necessarily directed to you, but to mm -hmm. the people around you. Yeah. And you spoke to, to the people around you, the other kids. We were kids, you see. Mm. Now, you must have been speaking French then. Of course. Mm -hmm. That was one of the main things, is that I got to speak French pretty fluently, and it was a language that I had all to myself and to my sisters mm -hmm. and got to the point we were told when we had a meal at home if you can't speak French at table so suddenly it would be silent because my sisters and I all always spoke French together and it irritated my father because he couldn't follow us <laughs> it takes wow. an adult a longer time to learn a language it than does. for yeah. children and of course, we use the language because we heard it all the way around it. Yes. My two younger sisters went to public school and they learned French quickly. Yeah. And I heard them talk and I picked it up. And I heard French in the École Normale. I heard French in the Conservatoire. Mm -hmm. So I picked it up too. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> wow. So French. When you first met Mr. Corto in the United States, were you speaking English with him or was he speaking French? Oh, I didn't speak French, you see, that time. So he spoke broken English, not well at all. Right. But, uh, he, uh, he said that if I ever came to Paris, we should look him up. Yeah. And he did, first thing. Wow. And the next thing I knew, we were at the Echo Normal, and I was sitting in the class with uh, Madame Giro. Mm -hmm. He had also a very good assistant whose name was Madame Lefebure. He was a fabulous pianist and teacher. Yes. Wonderful. And uh, I, I was learning. Did, now, did you hear him in concert? Do you recall? I mean, you recall hearing Hoffman in concert and Petri. Did you oh. also hear Corto in concert? Any time and went to all of his lecture mm. cycles. So he gave those very frequently. He thought of himself, not as only a pianist, but, and also he conducted the orchestra for me. The mm. very first time I played with orchestra. Really? What did you play? I played the A major Mozart concerto. Wow. Number 23, I think it is. It is 23. <clears throat> how, how old would you have been at the time? I was seven. Hmm. Wow. What was your impression of Corto's playing? Because, again, all of these musicians we're talking about, they all had such a unique style. And you can hear, like, within three seconds, you can tell that's Hoffman or that's Corto yeah. from their but sound. Corto was very easy. Corto, you could tell all the time. He never practiced, mm -hmm. and so he had a terrible technique. He played wrong notes right and left, mm -hmm. but he made sense. He made musical sense, and he always s said something with his music. His music spoke to you. Mm -hmm. You didn't just hear a A major scale when he played. Yeah. He would say something, and that was the main gist of what I learned from him, is that when you play music, music is a language, and it speaks. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking to you. If I just said, ba, 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 it wouldn't mean anything. Yeah. You have to put meaning into what you say. Mm -hmm. And there's some inherent meaning that's already there. 
Yes. You get to draw out. But these people, they really did communicate. I mean, the way, especially with Corto, Corto is one of the ones who, you know, there's this rise and fall and the timing that works together with that. It's not like the rubato is separate from the phrasing. It's part, that's part of the whole package of how he would communicate so eloquently. He was such an amazing pianist. Was his, what about his sound? Because, you know, we hear, of course, in a lot of these old recordings, we get an idea of the sound, but it's so different if you're in the room with these people and are in a concert hall. Do you what do you recall about his sonority or his the sound of his playing? And well, now as I was telling you, he used to give these little lecture recitals, mm -hmm. and he did these about once a week or so. And I went to every one of them, and I got used to hearing him talk and to like sonority. I mean, he couldn't say the word without making it do something and then I got to the point where I would learn a piece and then try to make it do something make it say something and I remember I went to play for him what did your piece say he asked me hmm. So I said, well, I tried to make it say thus and so. He said, well, I'll show you how you can do that. Try to make a crescendo here. Hmm. Give me a window there. Hmm. So I tried making the little crescendo here and the little window. Oh boy, it, it did say something. Hmm. He said, now take that as a start and do something for yourself. Put an accent there too. Do something. Mm -hmm. Don't just play notes. So I learned how to do something. Wow. And when you learn uh, as a little girl to do something. And if you do the same thing on another piano, it won't work. Mm -hmm. So you have to do something else. Mm -hmm. Wow. Every piano is a different experience. And that makes things exciting, too. Mm -hmm. Always an adventure. Yeah. So then we've got, so there was Hoffman, Petri, Schnabel, and, and then Corto. Yeah. So Rachmaninoff was the last of the great five that you met out of all of these? Yes. Well, that was by accident, actually. Okay. I was uh, traveling as a child prodigy pianist. And I think we were in Sacramento at the time that my father got a telegram from a manager in Los Angeles. Could I take, could I present a concert on a particular date that was only 10 days away? And yes, I was free on that day. We could show up there. He had booked Rahman enough to play the concert recital at Philharmonic Auditorium. And due to a sprained elbow or something, Rahman enough canceled the concert. He was no longer young and he didn't want to play. So he canceled and Mr. Armitage did not want to return the money to all the people to me and sold tickets. And he thought that if he replaced the artist with a big showstopper like Child Prodigy, that would be all right. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. And everybody was pleased. My father got his check and the manager was pleased. And I walked out on stage. I played one of the pieces that was on his program that I was working on at the time. I think it was Schumann's Carnival. And uh, of course I couldn't play it like Ralph Marner. Didn't mm -hmm. even pretend to. 
but I was working on it at the time. And I told the audience, this is a piece that I'm working on and I could play it. Wow. And I went through and did play it. <laughs> they were satisfied. And eventually, Mr. Rachmaninoff, who lived in the outskirts of Los Angeles, he had a house there, heard that his place was taken. Everybody was satisfied. Mm -hmm. And his place was taken by a nine-year-old girl. And he wanted to hear me play. But I was traveling at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was too. One time I was back in Paris where we lived between concert tours. And the telephone rang and it was Mr. Rachmaninoff who called my father, said, I want to hear your daughter Ruth play. Hmm. Said, Bring her to my hotel room. It was at the Villa Majestique in Paris. It's a residential hotel. And uh, bring her to my room 10.30 on such and such a day. And that's how I met him. Wow. My, my father came and told me that I was going to play for Ralph Monerna. Me? Play for him. Well, he just called up and asked to hear you play. Hmm. Well, I couldn't get out of it. Nope. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so I went there and here, when we got out of the elevator, I heard this very slow practice, very slow. And I thought, gosh, she's got a slow student. But we rang the bell and the playing stopped. Realized that's Mr. Rachmaninoff playing that slow. Mm -hmm. And he opened the door. He was an immensely tall person. Yeah. And I was quaking in my shoes. And I'm a very small girl. And he looked way down at me, and he had this long hand, with long finger, and pointed at me. And he said, you mean that plays the piano? That was how I met Mr. Rahman or not. Goodness. I was really quaking in my shoes. Well, anyway, my father gave me a good push, get inside the door, and Mr. Rachmaninoff could see that I was dazed. Mm -hmm. He said, sit down in that chair. I sat down, and he took from his pocket picture. It's a picture of his speedboat. He loved fast cars, fast boats, fast anything. He loved to drive them. He said, mm -hmm. this is my boat. Because I have a place in Switzerland. And I go in that boat, and I can press this button that you can see here in the picture. And the boat goes <laughs> all over the lake. And he was drawing that. And he could. I was following his hand in circles as he was showing me that. <laughs> and I started to laugh. Mm -hmm. And he could see I was all relaxed then. Wow. Now, now you can play for me. So I thought he was nice. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you remember what you played? Well, something that I had practiced on. It was maybe Bach or something. But whatever it was, it's, you know, 
Hmm. The main thing that he told my father was something my father didn't like to hear. He said, don't make her concertize. Hmm. Let her learn. Let her become a good musician first. Let her know what she is doing. Hmm. It was wise counsel. And something my father did not want to hear. Hmm. Imagine. But somewhere during there, Mr. Ralph Modernuff said, what's your most difficult piece? And at that time, my most difficult piece was the Rondo Brilliant of Van Weber. It's mm -hmm. a nice show piece, mm -hmm. something to end my programs with. And so I was practicing on that. So what key is it in? In flat major. He said, Play it for me in G major. Oh. Well, I have perfect pitch. Slowly, note by note, I did about two lines. Both hands together, but I could do it. And then Mr. Rafarno said, all right, now play it for me the way you learned it. Mm -hmm. But he saw that I could transpose. Yeah. And that I had the makings of something. He was satisfied. Great. Then he said, did you ever learn any of thing that I wrote? No. He said, well, get two books of preludes. And he said, next week, maybe, if you have the time, bring me number four in D major. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a darn difficult prelude. <laughs> and expected me. At that time, well, I did. Hmm. I learned. What an invitation, though, for yeah. him to ask you to learn that one. And then, do you remember then yeah. playing it for him? Yes, of course. Somebody like that is a, like a grandfather. Hmm. Tells you to learn something, you learn it. Mm -hmm. And he tells you how to do it, he shows you how to do it. Amazing. Uh, one of the things I did, he said, your sound. He said, you sound just like a little girl. I said, but I am a little girl. He said, when you sit in front of this instrument, whether you're seven years old or 70, you are a pianist. You, right now, you have no sound. You have to make that piano have a sound. Mm. Whether you're a pianist or you're not. Wow. That's really insightful. And, I mean, I know your recordings, and I know you make a sound. <laughs> you, you definitely produce a big sound, so you must have really... Well, I, got that that, very I don't seriously. think the sound is not in the piano. The sound is inside of you. That's right. And he showed me how to get that sound. Yeah. Not in one easy lesson. No. But I can sit in front of any piano and I will get what that piano has to, and show it. Yeah. I'll make it sound somehow. And the way you do that is that the sound comes from the balls of your feet and it goes all through you and out through your backbone, mm -hmm. your knee forward, and you make that sound come out. Mm -hmm. Not in the piano, it's inside of you. Anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. 
all of the great teachers said you have to hear the sound first that you want to produce before you can do it. Mm -hmm. All of them said that. But that's a fascinating, the way he speaks to, you know, your role at the keyboard when you're sitting there you're in that role as a pianist. It's not you as a young girl. It's not him as an older man. It's you're there as a pianist. Yes. That's amazing. So he then, it sounds like he really helped you develop that capacity to get that fullness of sound and presence. Well, I learned from a person named George Inesco that yes. you, Legend. you learn from many different sources, not just from one. Mm -hmm. You cannot learn from one person or mm -hmm. you become a small copy of that one person. That's right. If you learn this from this person and that from another person and these three things from that person mm -hmm. and this person, well, you learn so many different things. Mm -hmm. You sit in front of a piano and you try different ways of playing and you decide which kind you're going to use for this concert. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't care what kind of a piano they give me to play on. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So Inescu, did you meet him in Paris? Was it in Paris as well where you met him? Yes. An incredible musician. What did you, what specifically do you remember? You just brought him up in this context of sound and I'm, I'm interested to know more. Well, he was a very wonderful person. Even his voice, I remember, is being very round and deep, very nice gentleman amazing so you really i mean just the richness of meeting all of these people like you said and learning from all of them incredible are there any other i mean as much as you can learn from people even without lessons I mean, when you hear a pianist, a great pianist play, or you hear somebody say something, like you said, you know, you're absorbing and you're learning from them. Are there any other pianists from that time who stand out for you that you heard in concert? Look, I learned from everybody. Mm -hmm. I learned even from pianists whom I don't like. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. <sighs> I learned. That's why I say it. it it's always a learning experience yeah it isn't because i'm brilliant or anything i'm not but i have learned how to listen mm -hmm. and i try to produce something that i feel is possible in the music mm -hmm. now you've recorded extensively Mm -hmm. um, I have this and I love this wonderful set that came out a few years ago of your Deco recordings. Um, and when we were talking about Petri, I mean, one of the things with him, for example, is, you know, sometimes he was on in the studio and sometimes not. And I think a lot of artists could be really comfortable in front of the microphone and other artists were really at their best on stage. Was there a difference for you? Did you have a preference? Well, you know, every time that you record, it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. My first recordings that I, I made knowingly uh, were at three different microphones in the studio, which I didn't fuss with, but which they fussed with incessantly. And I would play on the piano and the microphone. You know, all over the place. Hmm. But I had nothing to do with it. And the most irritating thing was I would go backstage and I'd say, all right, can I hear what that sounded like? And I'd see this person, I was listening, and he'd press a button here, 
press a button. Press a button there. What do those buttons do? Well, when you play too loud, this makes it softer. You play too fast, this makes it a little slower. <laughs> you know? I work so hard to do this, and you're undoing it. This is one of the things that I wonder <laughs> about and I'm concerned about with modern recording techniques, yeah. where there's all this technical yeah. adjustment going on. Yes, and it's something, and they get prizes for doing that. I, I work... I have had a long recording life, and I had the experience of working with Tom Frost mm -hmm. and David Frost, the son. And both of them were big prize winners in the area of sound recording. Hmm. <laughs> but they're really, you know, there's all that adjustment. I mean, back when, you know, Corto and Petri and Rachmaninoff were making the 78s, I mean, there was less interference going on with these kinds of adjusting of levels, I suspect. So and we would, Corto would just leave some wrong notes in because that's what he played and they wouldn't have to correct it. Um, well, when he played, he played wrong notes. I mean, he couldn't play without them because he never practiced. Yeah, but it was still wonderful. I mean, there are people who've said, it's like, oh, even his wrong notes are fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're living at a time now where... You know this focus on perfection like the 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 sense of perfection is a clinical level of no wrong notes um but then what's being said sometimes i mean they, they sometimes you can communicate fine and you know we don't want to hear wrong notes but you know what's being communicated i would think would be hopefully would be more important um and, you know, recordings have changed everything because you can just listen at home when you want. And you listen and, you know, I put you on repeat and the same performance comes out. Did you prefer playing concerts? I mean, I know a number of artists just, you know, they did recordings because that's what an artist would do. But they really preferred the spontaneity and the engagement with an audience in live performance was... Was that something that you preferred or you were at ease with both? That's a hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. Making music is, as I said, it's a kind of communication. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times I would feel terrible. I would be exhausted, just tired, just not feel good. And I could walk out on stage and there would be a, a lady with a nice smile, the third row that I caught. So I'd play to that lady. And things came to life, and it was a gorgeous concert. Had I not seen that lady, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's such a thing as... You have to be able to give. Yeah. You have, if you're able to give, you have nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Some people are able to give gracefully. Some people you have to pull. <laughs> Get mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's the difference, right? In the concert, I mean, so different than in the studio where it's maybe an empty room or you see the engineers through a window. But, you know, here you get to see a lady with a nice smile and wearing a nice hat or there's some kind of you, you're you're playing for somebody who's in the same space as you. And so I imagine that that would be, it would feel a bit more personal. Sometimes I play a story. I tell the story. Sometimes I play for my husband. He's been dead since 2000. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Wow. And you made a record even just that came out last year. Yeah. 
you made a new recording. It's wonderful. And your sound is still, you're still producing that big, rich sonority that reminds me of all those great pianists that you... That well, you I told with. you how. Yeah. And it's amazing. The balls of your feet goes all through and comes out at the piano. Amazing. Amazing. And... Um, I'm just trying to think what else I'd like to ask you. This is, it's so fascinating to be able to speak with you and hear these stories of these, you know, I've admired all of these musicians for, you know, since I was a teen and they discovered these historical recordings, you know, 35 years ago. And you got to meet all of, and hear all of these incredible musicians. And they all had such different personalities. That's one thing that stands out that, you know, you like we were mentioning before, you could hear Hoffman's sound that was different than Corto sound, and that would be different than Schnabel's sound. But they also had such an individual approach, each of them at the keyboard, like their style of playing was different. Was it challenging for you having learned from all of these different people to have your own style? Or did you just, you just did what you wanted? No, I think that I give the best I can do every time I sit down to play. I don't think about mm -hmm. anything else. How, how can I make this sound like that? Sometimes it's a story that I'm trying to tell. Wonderful. Well, like you were saying, I mean, just that, the image, the die Blume, <laughs> and that rise and fall of the sentence. I mean, there is really something that we hear when you play that's beyond the notes that you're transmitting. That's really lovely to hear what's behind that. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about this. Oh, you were fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, likewise. I mean, it's just really fascinating being able to to know because I think so many people look at the keyboard and they look at the page and they see the black dots and they see the black and white notes and you know there is all of that that needs to be navigated but there's so much more that's behind all of that to be communicated can't really put it into words that's it that's what's so hard and that's the difficulty the musicians couldn't put in the uh, composers couldn't put it into words and they put it into music but then that's another level of difficulty. How do we communicate all of that? Wow, so insightful. Thank you so much for your time. It's been yeah, lovely speaking. Well, thank you. Well, you're a wonderful interviewee. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>